Some easy points you can gain on your emergency medicine shelf exam come from the environmental and miscellaneous sections of the exam. Moving over to environmental, and we're going to discuss all things water related. The first is discern whether or not the difference between water rescue, non-fatal drowning, and fatal drowning. Drowning is the respiratory impairment after submersion into a liquid. It's often water. Non-fatal is high risk of aspiration, R is arrhythmia, hypothermia, there are no electrolyte abnormalities present, fatal meaning death, and water rescue is when the patient undergoes submersion without any respiratory difficulties. If the patient dove into shallow water, you always want to check for a C-spine fracture. And then the number one factor for survival is the amount or the duration of immersion. The most common arrhythmia and cardiac arrest in drowning patients is asystole, not V-fib. There are four causes of barotrauma in scuba diving patients. The first is Kisson's disease, also known as decompression sickness, also known as the bends. It occurs when you're ascending too quickly. These signs and symptoms are periarticular pain, such as around the shoulders, joints, elbow joints, uh, cutis marmorata, which is venous stasis, paritis, erythema. There is no loss of consciousness in these patients. And then the treatment is 100% oxygen. Sometimes you can go ahead and do hyperbaric oxygen as well. Nitrogen narcosis occurs when the diver submerges to a depth greater than 100 feet with signs and symptoms consistent with impaired motor function and loss of consciousness. You want to be aware that while the ascent to shallow waters is the treatment, the patient could remain disoriented and this could lead to a drowning event. And then air embolism is the air bubbles basically cross the alveolar capillary membrane and move into circulation. So the patient's going to present with symptoms like Uh, PE-like, MI-like, stroke-like symptoms. The patient will have loss of consciousness while ascending or within 10 minutes of surfacing. And patients with patent foramen ovales or septal defects are more susceptible. You want to place these patients in left lateral decubitus with Trendelenburg. And the last is pneumomediastinum. Uh, These patients will have uh, crepitus and the treatment will be supportive. There are two main disorders to understand in terms of high altitude illness. So both high altitude cerebral edema or HACE and high altitude pulmonary edema, HAPE, fall under the general umbrella of high altitude illness. Prevention of any of the high altitude disorders is gradual ascent. Acute mountain sickness is the most common cause of high altitude illness. Patients will have a headache and other nonspecific symptoms. If they continue to climb higher, acute mountain sickness will become high altitude cerebral edema, where they will develop ataxia, vomiting, confusion, seizures, and coma. Descent down the mountain is the definitive treatment and should occur immediately. Dexamethasone and mannitol can also be beneficial for these patients. The prophylaxis is acetazolamide. Moving over to high-altitude pulmonary edema, it's the most common cause of death among all the different high-altitude illnesses. Signs and symptoms include non-productive cough and shortness of breath progressing to non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema two to four days after rapid ascent. The treatment is oxygen. You can use PDE5 inhibitors as well. You want to avoid diuretics and nitrates, and the prophylaxis is nifedipine. We've gone through disorders related to drowning in water, scuba diving, Mountains, high altitude, now we're going to talk about those related to snow. There's four main ones, frost frost nip, excuse me, frostbite, trench foot, and pernio. Frost nip is reversible transient freezing of the skin. It's localized paresthesias that resolve with rewarming. Frostbite, on the other hand, is irreversible local tissue freezing. And there's four degrees, essentially. The first degree is superficial there's erythema, there's no blisters present. Second degree is full thickness, there's clear blisters. Third degree is hemorrhagic blisters and skin necrosis. And fourth degree is where you'll see it extend to the bone. For frostbite specifically, the clear blebs are a good prognostic factor. A bad prognostic factor would be hemorrhagic blebs. You want to to debride the clear blisters, you want to leave the hemorrhagic ones alone. The treatment for both frost, frost nip and frostbite is rapid rewarming with circulating water at a temperature between 37 and 39 celsius. For trench foot, 
That's basically immersion injury with prolonged exposure to non-freezing temperatures. It can cause tissue loss. And then pernio is repetitive exco exposure to temperatures just above the freezing point. It's localized inflammatory lesions. So these lesions are red and purple in color and very painful. There are two heat-related illnesses for the emergency medicine shelf exam you'll need to know. The first is heat exhaustion, which is hyperthermia and normal central nervous system function. If they have decreases in central nervous system dysfunction, they will rapidly correct with cooling mechanisms and rest. On the alternative, for heat stroke, the patient will have hyperthermia usually greater than 40 Celsius, which is 104 Fahrenheit, and central nervous system dysfunction. This includes things like headache, disorientation, altered mental status, seizure, coma, and these patients often have multi-organ failure, such as shock, ARDS can even be present. Um, evidence of tissue destruction is high, CK levels, signs of rhabdo, and then AST is the most sensitive lab finding in these patients for presence of tissue destruction. The treatment for both these disorders, heat exhaustion and heat stroke, is rapid cooling. And what you'll do for this is the cooling measures are as follows. You're going to rapidly decrease the core temperature to 39 Celsius. Overshooting can cause rebound hyperthermia. You want to use evaporation techniques such as water spray, fans, ice water immersion, as these are all beneficial. You want to avoid antipyretics such as ibuprofen and acetaminophen. So here is the percent body surface area or the BSA diagram that shows you what percentage of the body part counts for the total. You want to recall that the palms of the patient and private parts are 1% while the arms and heads account for 45 the legs for 9, and the torso and back each account for 18%. There are three degrees of burns. The first degree burn is epidermis only. There's no blisters. You want to think about sunburns. The second degree burn is a partial thickness, which means that it goes through the dermis and there are blisters present. Sensation is intact. Third degree burns are full thickness burns with loss of sensation and a white waxy lesion. Recall that the burn resuscitation requires the Parkland formula. You want to use lactated ringers for resuscitation. Half the necessary fluid needs to be used within the first 8 hours, followed by the other half during the next 16 hours. This will optimize the care, and you want to monitor this by monitoring the patient's urine output to determine the efficacy of the fluid resuscitation. Recall that hourly urine output for adults should be 0.5 milliliters per kilogram. The ATLS guidelines set the criteria for when you need to refer patients to a burn un unit. The high yield part of this is those with burns to the face, hands, genitals, ears, feet, and major joints, and those who have full thickness burns in any size of any group, whether it be adult, elderly, or, or pediatric patient. Additional indications for a burn unit include inhalation injuries such as singed nasal hairs, soot in the mouth, children, and children less than one year in age. The indications for escherotomy are as follows, circumferential burns of the chest or neck that impair breathing, or circumferential burns to extremities that uh, lead the patient at risk to developing compartment syndrome. For snakes, spiders, and scorpions, there are two types of snakes, the crotalids and the elipids. The crotalids includes rattlesnakes, moccasins, and copperheads. The treatment is antivenom. The elipids include coral, cobras, and mambas, and the treatment is supportive. So basically any of the snakes in the U.S., we have an antivenom and go ahead and use it. Um, all cases of um, snake bites, uh, you need to discuss with the poison control. In terms of the spider bites, there's two big ones, the brown recluse versus the black widow. Brown recluse spiders have this necrotic central eschar, which will form within three to four days. Loxosalism refers to the systemic reaction that can happen one to two days after the bite, fever, chills, renal failure, DIC, hemolysis. The bite may not be witnessed, and laboratory workup should include CBC, CMP, coags, and urinalysis. The treatment is supportive. When you look at the black widow spider, you're gonna ha the patient will describe having an immediate pinprick sensation. The bite is often witnessed. Symptoms come on quickly within one hour. An erythematous target-shaped lesion will appear. The patient will complain of myalgias, diaphoresis, vom 
diaphoresis, vomiting, and respiratory failure. The treatment is supportive, analgesics, benzos, and you may consider hospitalization and antivenin. And last but not least, scorpion stings. There's typically no bite or sting mark. The venom acts in an excitatory fashion, so especially children will have unusual eye movements, hypersalivation, and muscle jerking. A special kind called the centroides species is life-threatening, and the patient will complain of pain and paresthesia at the site. Antivenin is available, however, it is extremely rare. Very briefly, I forgot to talk about the hymnoptera, which refers to bees, wasps, hornets, yellow jackets, and ants. Stings typically incite local reactions, however, they can lead to anaphylaxis. The last portion of the environmental includes the ocean, so on this slide I wanted to break down the um, high yield, and you will have a question on your shelf with this, um, ocean and habitat versus the treatment. For sea urchin and jellyfish sting, you're going to use vinegar, and then 30 minutes later use hot water. Portuguese man of war, which stings on the dorsal or the top foot, the stingray and the coral are all treated with hot water. And last but not least, the miscellaneous section. Just a few things to go over. MTALA is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. It mandates that all persons who present to an ER receive a medical screening exam. VA and military, military hospitals are exempt. The four components of informed consent are nature of the procedure, most significant risks of the procedure, benefits, any possible alternatives to the procedure, including the risk of not having anything done. And lastly, the exceptions to informed consent is therapeutic privilege is an exception. If giving the information would severely harm the patient or undermine the informed consent process, it's okay to withhold the information. And then suicidal patients cannot give or withhold consent. So that's it, uh, your high-yield emergency medicine shelf examination review. And if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. And thank you all so much for your time.